Welcome, everyone. I am Chris Gore. This is Hollywood on the Rocks on a Wednesday. And we've got a lot to talk about. On the show today, we are going to discuss Sydney Sweeney in Immaculate for a new horror film. It's opening this Friday. I'm coming to you with an early review. Plus, we'll be talking about Sweet Baby Gang and a little history of censorship in gaming going all the way back to the 90s when the U.S. government fought against violence in video games way back when. I've got stories to tell. You're not going to believe it. Plus your chat comments and questions. It's a jam-packed show. And the Acolyte trailer, yes, it dropped. We have to talk about it. We have to talk about it. It's going to be a rapid-fire show today, so strap in get ready ing the merciless is here he's waiting in the wings thank you for your patience alan says do it don't say it do it don't say it alan's right alan's right as usual so let's go let's just go come on yeah you gotta keep up you gotta keep up yeah gotta keep up keep it up Rock it hard, make it work, and make it so. That's not what I meant to, like, uh... Alan! 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 Al! Alan! Alan. Rock Big it show hard. today. We got, we got <laughs> X-Men to talk about. I dragged out my... I've got these, uh... These Oakley sunglasses I bought when the first X-Men movie came out. What was it? 2000. This is a prop replica from the James Marsden wore these exact Oakley's in that movie. And I bought them for $300. It was the most I'd ever spent on a pair of glasses. We're going to talk about (laughs) X-Men. A lot going on. What's up with you, man? Oh gosh. Um, just a whirlwind i'm busy i've been watching too many damn tv shows and yeah <laughs> body problem uh, i mean each hour is long each episode is long and then we have x-men um i uh, i'm busy <laughs> that's a good well it's a good thing it's a good thing and also by the way for those who are asking yes gary's probably still doing the nooner right now which is why we only have like 1100 people watching live but I had to liquefy my lunch. I'll be drinking a smoothie through the show because I had no time to make a sandwich on the show. By the way, 1100 is a good number. That's a good number. And we appreciate it. Hey, uh, before we get to your chat comments and questions here, and we're going to like launch right in because I have so much to talk about today. So much to talk about. I want to let you guys know about Criticless. Criticless.com is our sponsor. We want to thank them. Go to criticless.com. It is a free speech site where you can share your opinions about movies. Alan and I both have accounts on there. I am that Chris Gore. What are you, Alan? My pal Al. My pal Al. So there you go. Um, Find us on there. Check out criticless.com. It's a, basically a social network where you can share your movie opinion and we appreciate them and their support of the channel. Okay, now let's get to a couple of comments and questions before we launch in. And Robert Paul Champagne says, God, I could stare at this thumbnail for days. <laughs> yes, well, well. You should have been on the discussion of that thumbnail. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it says, I want to personally thank Alan and Glenn for this beautiful edit. Castigan <laughs> says, uh, is it cool to post a link to what Sid wore at the premiere? It contains side boob. We can absolutely do that. And uh, Orlando and Isabel says these Sydney Sweeney thumbnails are getting out of control. What do you mean? Out well, of control. I'm say, we're, we're actually going to talk about her. Unlike we're other- actually going to talk about her. Yeah, we're going to talk about Immaculate, her new movie. I'm just here for Sydney Sweeney. Um, yeah, so am I. Uh, hi, Chris and Alan. And thank you for being a member. Uh, Judicon says for five says, hail Chris and Alan. Will there be a film threat meetup in Vegas? If so, where and when looking forward to partying with you all. Yes, there's going to be a meetup. There's going to be a meetup at the millennium fandom bar on Tuesday, April 9th at 7 PM. You do need a ticket, 
but tickets are free. So you can, there will be a link in the description. Uh, it's the official film thread CinemaCon VIP Vegas meetup for A-listers only. That's not true, but uh, it's not just for, it's for anybody. It's for anybody, but please join us. The link will be in the description and I want you all to join us. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'll put the link in the private chat. So Ms. B Coffee can put it in the chat. So, so thank you, Judicon, for that. Member for 12 months, Jester of Roanoke says, used to work as a projectionist. Miss it profoundly. Yeah, everything is automated now. Do you know this when you go to a movie theater? Some of the movie theaters, they don't even have a projectionist. It's just like a, it's all controlled by Skynet, effectively, somewhere, some other location. Uh, yeah, it's weird. And uh, yeah. Yeah, those were the days. Sons and Shadows for two says, speaking of TV shows, happy 25 years of Farscape. Yeah. Wow. Yep. There you go. And hey, Blue Collar Loser for five says, hey, guys, today is Roadhouse. Tomorrow is Ghostbusters. Any hope for either one? Lol. I'm afraid to watch X-Men. Also, Chris, great thumbnail. You genius. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, the genius is Glenn, our producer. We appreciate him. So thank him. But it was like, we want to talk about all these things. Today's like a mixed bag. Wednesday's kind of our mixed bag show. Friday, we do movie reviews. By the way, we will have Ghostbusters and Roadhouse on Friday. We'll be discussing them. Today is X-Men, uh, Sydney Sweeney's new movie, Immaculate, and a bunch of news stories um, and, and uh, a story related to... Uh, Sweet baby ink. So there you I'm go. We don't even have to talk about her movie. We could we could just talk about her. Yeah. Wait, did I say Professor Savage Dad? What a great name. Has become a YouTube member. And by the way, if you're a member of the channel, you get exclusive content. And I'm gonna I have to bring this up. I went to a premiere of a movie called Um Hundreds of Beavers. If you go to our if you go to our page, wait, let me share screen here. Uh, Alan, we try to post at least a couple times, if not several times a week. Um, uh, look, we're live. Look, that's us live. Um, and we, we post for members only videos, members only videos. There's a really good one of Alan here. I'll have to, we'll have to There's look several. at that later, but, um, Sydney Sweeney was at the immaculate premiere. I was about six feet from her for about, 10 seconds when she walked up um, here it is. She's getting introduced at the premiere. So she's coming out, but it's uh, for members only. I shot this. I was in the second row. Where is she coming out here? What is taking so long? Wow, that's a Come very on, guys. long video of not her. <laughs> What's that? That, yeah, I thought that was her, which is why I kept zooming in on the nun with the red mask. But um, her dad was at the screening. So there you go. Here she yeah. is. Yeah. There's Sydney Sweeney. Yeah. We'll just Be show her. Uh, I, you think everybody, but one more person thanks to you. And I owe so much to you. Mike and I have worked together since I was 19 years old. This is our third project together. And I could not be more excited to be creating memories and incredible pieces with you so thank you um <laughs> so if if you want to see the whole the whole uh video it's for you members want, only want to see the whole the whole video just just become if you're already a member just go there and i i think some of our members don't even understand the benefits that they have access to the discord and exclusive videos. And um, I'm actually seeing Sydney Sweeney again. This is oh, not a thing. We're, um, we're moving at, into stalker territory here. No, no, no. There's another screening of immaculate this Friday at the AMC Burbank 16. I also have tickets to that and um, I'll record that as well. If you'd like to see it. Uh, and before we get started, like share, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications and join us as a member. I just demonstrated why it's important. Thank you, Lord Thoth. We appreciate you. All right, let's get into it with our first story. Um, we got a lot of banners here um, and we're going to get to the Immaculate Review. So much stuff to get into. I'm going to, let's start with this. We've been talking about this for some time. Now we have confirmation. 
Hollywood is in a full-fledged depression as the industry contracts. We've been talking about this since last year when the term flopbuster was introduced. And now we have confirmation. I'm going to share a screen here uh, from Deadline. Hollywood contraction hits entertainment executive jobs. This is a full-scale depression. Now they're saying it out loud. We've been talking about this for some time. It is now full-fledged depression from Nelly and Driva and Deadline. We'll put the link in the description. And uh, I'll read this briefly. LinkedIn is usually used by professionals for networking with people in their field, posting updates when they get a new job, or congratulating friends on their promotions. These days, as one former industry type put it, it's become a therapy site for unemployed entertainment executives who share their frustrations over the lack of opportunities in Hollywood amid a major contraction. I've seen a lot of downturns, lots of job losses, but I've never seen anything like this. One veteran uh, top TV executive said, this is a full scale depression for the entire, for the entertainment industry. Over the past year, there have been layoffs, waves of layoffs at Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery, Paramount, NBC Universal, Amazon, MGM Studios, Lionsgate, which acquired E1, Netflix, Sony, Fifth Season, and most talent agencies, including CAA and UTA. By the way, CAA and UTA, two of the top uh, agencies that represent people like Tom Hanks, mm -hmm. some of the big talent, represented by CAA and UTA uh, going on the dire situation bordering on worst case scenario. The season TV executive said was created by a perfect storm of COVID strikes and poor management decisions coming to roost driven by short sighted moves by media companies aimed at goosing their quarterly reports to appease wall street. Those venting about their experiences on LinkedIn say that they have sent hundreds of job applications and never got a response to the majority of them, not even from HR. Some have been on the sidelines for more than a year. This is when, quick side note, I have friends that have been unemployed and uh, one friend of mine who was a producer in TV went to culinary school to change his career as a, a kind of a high-end cook at a restaurant. You can make decent money doing that. This is how bad things are. Um, been on the sidelines for more than a year while trying to pick up consulting and other part-time gigs to pay the bills. The more senior executives turned to headhunters. I have certainly an influx of executives that reach out and say they're looking for their next job, said top Hollywood executive recruiter Jamie Waldron, senior partner, global head of sports, blah, blah, blah. Big, big, falutin, high falutin title. His conservative estimate is that a good 20% of the VP and above executive workforce in media and entertainment is out of work from a year ago. 20% out of work. If, let's say this, first of all, not a huge figure when it comes to SAG actors. Actors, the it's the highest unemployment rate of any, almost any profession. 20% of people working in executive, the executive suite in entertainment, that's substantial. 20% uh, from a year ago. If that was like a U.S. like, hey, you know, uh, unemployment rate, that would be crazy. Based on his observations, legal and marketing executives have been heavily impacted, followed closely by development executives. There is no doubt a contraction, Waldron added. It just makes it tough in the short term. I feel like with a lot of good executives, I can't meet everybody that wants to meet to talk about that they're about to be unemployed or this the layoffs now happening. Um, it goes on more quotes, Alan, what are your thoughts? I want to hear your opinion about all yeah. of this. Can you go to that part of the article where it talks about the reasons for this I think, uh, uh Yes. For right COVID. there. Yeah, there situation, right there. So they created by a perfect storm of COVID strikes and poor management decisions. This is what you call, uh, not being able to read the room. Um, right. You know, I mean, right. honestly, COVID should have been a boon for, for these streamers. Uh, the, the fact that they're they're blaming it on, on the wrong things means that there's no hope and that they're they're in this situation and they have no why, no idea why and, and why we've been talking about this for years as to what's going on why why this industry is failing is the fact that they're not telling stories we want to hear right. you know, that, that that they're not telling stories that that resonate with us that we relate to 
Uh, and they haven't been doing that for a very long time. And quite frankly, from what we're seeing, uh, they still don't know. And they're going to still keep pushing the message, expecting us to shell out money. Um, you know, magical Negroes. Uh, no one wanted to hear that message. And no one was willing to pay money to see that message, except us critics and YouTubers. Well, <laughs> the, the, this... you know, go ahead. Sorry, no, th this is going to be obviously a developing story. The fact mm -hmm. that it's um, bubbled up mainstream in a in an out media outlet like Deadline, that's saying something. Yeah. That means the, audio, the, the industry needs to recognize this and reconcile it. And I think we're going to see a lot more uh, people changing careers. And I've heard leaving the industry, meaning mm -hmm. this industry, it's if it, it and, and look, we heard we heard um uh, over a year ago i was told that we went from 600 shows to now 300 shows that's 50 percent of the shows not just impacting executives but impacting people below the line that's people not on camera um mm -hmm. you know the, the people who do well frankly the real work on a film set um not to take anything away from the people you know uh, uh you know but like well, it, add it Hollywood. Everybody. Add the that's city that. of add the the city of Hollywood, the subsection of LA. You know yeah. that you know that's going to be impacted sorely. And and let's let's be real here. Um, what if oh, what if Kenobi was a good show? What if Rings of Power was a good show? What if everything we've been complaining about were good? You know, we wouldn't be right. talking about this. You know, they would right. have survived the pandemic. They would have survived COVID. And we wouldn't be talking like this, but they just don't know, and they still don't know the answer. And uh, this is this is. I mean, we've talked about it. The, the only way this is going to change is, I mean, I hate to say it, is is the complete financial destruction. And I think Disney is is headed that direction. And uh, you know, someone's got to someone's got to in these companies admit they made mistakes over the last five years. And the company, the first company to do that, to say that we we did it wrong, we followed the wrong people, listened to the wrong people, they're the ones who are going to survive this. Uh, I, I just wonder if Hollywood is going to come to an awareness that uh, the audience is not responding to the material, yep. and that needs to change, number one. And I think part of the way to change it is um, you're you're going to have to mm -hmm. you're going to have to get rid of some people that aren't focused on the plan. Right. The right plan, which is uh, uh, serving the needs of the audience. What are they responding to? They're not responding currently to what you're making. So you got to change. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's, let's pivot now. Do we have a, oh, oh, real quick super chat here from MK solid 82 for five. I agree with Gary that they will soon crown Sydney Sweeney as the new alt-right queen. Also, mm -hmm. Chris, how do you feel about the crow RIP star Wars as for Sydney Sweeney? Yeah. I just think that she's a political, she's part of the, He's part of the alt middle, but I'll just say this. If you know anything about politics, the middle decides who wins. Mm -hmm. It's really about winning the hearts and minds of the middle. And that's what everyone is battling for. Right. Well, the other um, thing is uh, Hollywood uh, culture won't let you succeed, uh, at least the wrong end of culture. Uh, if you succeed, uh, they're going to find something wrong with you. And it's usually that you're some alt right person. And uh, yeah, <laughs> you've turned that cartoon. Sorry, it's, do you really yeah. want to watch me eat my lunch? <laughs> Sorry about no, that. But, but, but that's, that's just it. Uh, you know, look, everything, everyone but you, anyone but you, uh, was a lesbian. You know, they're going to a lesbian destination wedding. It wasn't about the lesbians, but that was the, the thing there. That's hardly I was fine outright. with that. It didn't bug me because yeah. Sydney Sweeney yeah. was uh, the focus. Yeah. I didn't but care. That's, that's hardly all right. And, and to kind of go after her when she's making that attempt, at least to walk down the middle. Uh, I, I think the biggest crime of that lesbian relationship was that they were perfect, and uh, right, and, right. They were, they, and they, their they relationship were, was badly written. They were like, and they uh, were boring. They were absolutely boring, and that was, you know. Here's what you're going to see: you're going to see me, the media and journalists try to corner Sydney Sweeney mm -hmm. into taking stands on certain things, yeah. and it's not her. However, she answers. She's probably going to answer in a very uh, middle of the road way. Good for her. She yeah. should just stay out of it and be entertaining. And um, I, it's so weird to come out of a movie that was rejected by audiences that bombed. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly he's very popular. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, and uh, RIP The Crow or RIP Star Wars. Yes, we're going to get to that next. And uh, The Crow don't care, but I will see it. 
Yeah. I mean, it's tough because that, that movie was cursed from the very beginning. And Akinika, member for 20 months. Hey, we appreciate that support. Check out the full Sydney Sweeney video, including the they did a little musical thing at the beginning with all the nuns coming out. It was really creepy. So I have two videos on there. And then just, just go through. I created a members video only playlist, which Alan, you have a ton of videos and drafts that you haven't. I know seen. I need to get on it, but it's yeah, it's you need to do that. It's it's on the Q and A's. I, I feel right. like I could do it better, but uh just do it. I, yeah. But did you hey. film the swimsuit section of uh, of Immaculate? I did not. Uh, Akinika and says, appreciate you guys. Alan, Chris, great team. Thank you for that, Akinika. And Andrew Cram gifted five Film Threat memberships. Those people are very lucky. Thank you, Andrew Cram. Appreciate it. We got to do this, Alan. We have to do this. There's no way we can get around not doing this. We have to react to the <laughs> no. trailer. I, you knew I was going to do it. I know. It's on the list. You knew I was going to do it. I just so, regretting doing it. <laughs> but like before we set the table here, I'm going to bring, I got to bring the uh, video up. I just, I'm checked out on star. I've reached yeah. the point of apathy after, after Kenobi and after the trial, those that are maybe new viewers to the channel, please like share, subscribe. We appreciate when you subscribe and, and like the videos, it, it helps spread the word. We did an entire trial called critics court which was putting Lucasfilm and Disney on trial for the murder of Star Wars. Um, how do you beat a dead horse by oh, continuing? You know, you know, what I kept thinking about was we we defended George Lucas in, in Critics Court. Right. And then he comes out and in full support of, of Iger and the Disney board. And it's like, wow, we, we backed the wrong horse because uh, that guy's not going to save Star Wars. Yeah. Um, let, let, okay, so I don't care. I'm in a mind yeah. of like I'm checked out. Okay, but here it is. Trailers minute forty five. We're gonna watch it together because I want to get your reaction and hear your thoughts. So let's do this, Alan. Let's do it. Here do we it. go. Close, Close your, your eyes. eyes. Your eyes. Can this see you? We must not trust them. Tell me what comes into your mind. Life. Balance. I see fire. Uh. A couple things I may have oh, said. You, I, I, I had you muted. What's that? I had you muted. So uh, well, just just unmute me when I uh, speak up. Like I just have to get this one shot in. Where is it? No. Oh, that's not it. <laughs> no. What is it? Come on! Life. I gotta I gotta catch it quick. Here. Uh, I see. Okay. Close your eyes. That alien can't close its eyes. To me, this is all about attention to detail. And mm -hmm. one of the things that whatever you think about George Lucas, Star Wars, he had an attention to detail. You could easily do a digital blink, even make a mask that, mm -hmm. you know, they made masks that blinked. They could have done that. So that to me is an issue there. The other thing is I want to point out every single one of these kids is somehow related to someone who works on Star Wars or it's a favor from the executive. Every single one. Oh, my kid is a huge Star Wars fan. Can they be in Star Wars? Don't worry. So I guarantee those kids weren't cast. They're just friends of the production. Um, they go. And then the next shot we see is Carrie Ann Moss. Look carefully because they kind of hide her in the shadows. Hi. <laughs> Someone is killing Jedi. It doesn't make sense. What happened? I sense the darkness. This isn't about good or bad. 
it just looks it looks fairly generic and my question is my big question is is <laughs> anyone going to care about a star wars show that doesn't have any connection to the films nothing connected to the skywalkers nothing connected to the saga story nothing connected to the clone wars or any of the other events this takes place a hundred years right before the events but the in, uh, well the prequels even right yeah. so yoda's alive yoda's alive because he's 800 years old chewbacca's alive because he's 200 years old there will 100 percent be a yoda uh, uh there's going to be a yoda uh cameo that's gonna yoda, yeah but I, I i don't know the the way that the high republic the reaction to the novels and um, everything that's come out related to the High Republic has just been a complete. No one cares. Let's finish watching it. There's like yeah. 20 seconds left, but um, then I want to get your thoughts on the back end. Here we go. This is about power, and who is allowed to use it? Oh, I'm this sorry. Power. This is about power, and who is allowed to use it? It's yeah. this is. People that are incapable of writing subtext take the theme and just say it out loud. That's the theme. This is about power and who's allowed to use it. Keep that in mind. What, what is, is that? All right, Alan, what are your thoughts? Sorry, well, I, I mean, I look, look the, the thing that excites me about it is the story that it, it, it lays out uh, in this trailer. <laughs> There's no uh, story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I Because, I, look, the, the job of a trailer is to tell you why you need to see this. And what they're doing is they're they're putting flashy images in front of you, uh, uh, a story. You know, a bunch of lightsabers. Ooh, exciting. A red lightsaber. Ooh, there you go. That's why you need to see this. Uh, some fun action, some flippy floppy action. Uh, you gotta have you gotta have that that one phrase, you know. It's not about good and evil, it's about power and who gets the wheel. That's you know, it's th this has been the story of Disney, uh, all brands of Disney. Uh since for the last uh three years. Uh put just put trailers out that have have flashing images and uh, vague recollections of what what this story is going to be and that's what entices people to watch it and and i hate to say it um uh, no one's enticed to watch this uh you know i i've talked to my daughter and her friends about this or talked to my daughter and she talks about what her friends say and trailers these days especially disney trailers just don't excite people anymore because it doesn't say anything right. it, it just shows right. you what's there um, the fact that it takes place a uh, hundred years before the prequels, uh, not, you know, you don't know that in this, uh, no. and, and you don't care, you know, you know, what it presumes that if you want to see something that happened a hundred years before that you were excited about what happened a hundred years later and with what Disney's put out, why, why am I excited about that? You know, and cause quite frankly, this, you know, that opening sequence reminds me. Well, this is the just the moments before Order sixty six. I, I I get no sense of time in this. I, I it's just the the direction Disney Star Wars is going is is horrible, and uh, I have no idea where it's going. I have no idea what it's trying to tell me. And this has been the problem with Disney Star Wars uh, since Disney took over. Well, uh, years ago, a, a friend of mine, uh, both of us very into Star Wars, said mm -hmm. the problem with Star Wars as a story is it doesn't have a very deep bench of characters. Marvel, uh, mm -hmm. conversely, has a very large, deep bench of characters. Yeah. You could just make X-Men movies forever. That's why Fantastic Disney bought Four, it. <laughs> you know, like, like all, there's so many characters in the Marvel Universe that have so many great stories that you could, you could if you weren't so focused on the wrong thing, make great Marvel stuff forever. Star Wars doesn't have a deep bench. The deep, the, the, and, and they, by the approach with the sequels, which basically just destroys the legacy of the original trilogy and Anakin Skywalker sacrifice. Why do I even care anymore? Mm -hmm. This will answer the question. This show, this is why it's important. This show will answer the question. Do people care about Star Wars outside of Luke Han Leia Anakin, Obi-Wan, Padme, Ray, Finn, 
Poe, like, do do we care about anything outside of that or not? Just a story in the Star Wars world? We'll find out. I have a prediction. We'll see if this happens. <laughs> this is somehow going to connect to Palpatine, either Darth Plagueis and or Steve, uh, baby Sheev Pal Palpatine will be born of a Sith mother, something like that. So there'll be some connection, which will be like, oh, you got to see it. It connects to the beginnings of Palpatine or, or the Sith. It, so we'll and see. Who cares? <laughs> and who cares? Right. And also the Sith were not supposed to be around for a millennia, right? Which is thousand years no sith so is it gonna stick with canon probably not uh yeah but I, and I, again I, we'll just keep rehashing it who of, of this current generation who cares about canon you know the, the, well, they, the story of the sith uh palpatines who you know is the are these compelling stories that people want to hear uh you know it, this is just it's just misguided i'm you know what someone's been talking about the you know, Ahsoka was a hundred million dollars. How much is this thing? Uh, oh, how much money are they wasting with this one? This looks expensive, but I agree with Garrett. This looks like a fan film, and 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 this is not a disrespect to fan film, and I'll tell you why. Fan films have been spectacular. Fan mm -hmm. films have been epic with amazing lightsaber duels. Now that there's sort of basics in terms of sound and visual effects, access to that for fans have made some amazing movies. The thing is the thing that is the most, the, the weakest in a lot of the fan films generally is the acting or the casting. And that's where I feel the weaknesses in this other than Carrie Ann Moss. I didn't recognize anybody other yeah. than, I guess there's a Wookiee in there. Well, the, I Curry? guess the Asian guy is from hung, uh, hunger games uh, from squid games. Right. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, let me also bring up the... Well, that should make you happy, right, Alan? Yes, yes, because putting Asians in bad roles is the greatest thing you can do for diversity. Uh, the, the opening scene, uh, close your eyes. Uh, do, you know, it's basically the idea is you can't trust what you see. The question I have is what is the context for that? Um, you know, th that opening, that the way they set that up, is supposed to be this dramatic, you know, haunting ki kind of opening. But what what is that? You know, why is why should I be? Why should this draw me into the story? You know, what is the context of that? Why? Right. You know, and and at some point, the, the trailer should at least allude to an answer toward that. And uh, the idea that that you know you can't trust what you see. I'm not sure I understood in the rest of the tra trailer as to what I shouldn't be trusting or what I shouldn't be seeing. You know, uh, the fact that, yeah. And then, you know, you guys brought it up on, uh, on the nooner. It's, it's practically devoid of white people. Um, white males, white males. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, yeah. exclusion there, uh, whatever, it, you know, and quite frankly, I, I, I don't necessarily care. It's not like I, or I yearn to see more white people in things. Um, but you knew it was a decision. And that, that's always my problem with it. it it's it, You knew it was an intentional decision that was made to uh, to exclude white men from, from this trailer. Let's go to your comments and <laughs> questions here uh, very quickly because there's a lot. Chris G. Byron, who just became a YouTube member. Thank you. Check out the videos there. Spidey Sensei 72 for 8. The new trailer for the Black Panther game just dropped. Is this game made by the Sweet Baby Crew? No, it's not. Or some other game studio? No, it's not. It's directed by the woman who did Uncharted 2, Look Her Up. This and is the Captain America one you guys were? The Captain America 1943 trailer. We're not going to have time to get into that today, but go check that out. Uh, Red French Moon for two euros says a cantina in a tr in trailer. Been there, done that. Goes on to say, why using a lightsaber? This weapon will not kill. <laughs> and Narf Metmoan became a member. Spidey Sensei 72 says, well, the very obvious thing, which is I saw several Asians. So yes. Alan can't get mad at this trailer. Yeah, you're right. I'm not mad at this trailer at all. Good job. Um, Jester of Roanoke for two. Luke kissed his sister. So nepotism is on brand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dark Herophant goes, uh, says for two, Jed... E I Jed D E I Jed E uh, Jed D E I get yeah, it D E I yeah. Bill S Preston Esquire some flippity floppity action quote from Alan and Willie the Monkey King's music 
disagree, Alan. There is a story behind it. It's about the Jedi assassination. However, you're right. It's just flashy Star Wars imagery. Yeah. Plus, I, I don't. Uh, that. I mean, I'm supposed to get that from the trailer. Yeah. Uh, Brock, uh, Bruce Leroy Jenkins for five. The big bad will turn out to be a white guy. That's where. That's. That's why there were none shown during the trailer. And ICUP for four nine nine. Thoughts on Shogun? Uh, haven't seen it yet. Neither is Alan. I saw we the will, first half of the first episode. We will get to that when the series ends. We're going to do a review. But thank you, ICUP, for the five. And Mark, Mac Based Man, Mac Based Man said, everyone, everybody was force foo fighting. That's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Everybody was force foo fighting. I, I got to say something about that action. Um, you know, there, there's a scene in uh, Iron Claw where, uh, where the brothers are wrestling and uh, the, the stern warning from the Zac Efron character was uh, each move needs to mean something. There has to be a reason why you did a move as opposed to just doing a move. And that's what Star Wars yeah. has become. It's just become choreography. Um, uh, uh, Echo is another example of that. It's just uh, nice, cute action uh, just to, you know, buy a bunch of stunt people who want to do flashy things, flippy yeah. floppy things. Um that action scene just wasn't exciting. Uh, the, the that point where she's kind of dodging, dodging the weapon by uh, with her hands down and leaning back and forth, uh, is that really cool? It's is a that... style of fighting. It's a style of fighting that has been overused. Yeah, it's the drunken and master style of fighting. The... Yeah, and nothing but, but matters. Jackie it's Chan, man. Jackie Chan made it cool, and he again is drunken master. Uh, he was drunk at the time. Or that the character was supposed to be drunk at the time, which means that there was intention behind it. And there's no intention behind this. We're going to talk about uh, X-Men 97, the first three episodes. We're going to talk about Immaculate. But I have one quick thing that I want to discuss. Here's what we're about to discuss. Maybe it connects slightly to what we just saw. This commercial, it's at Check Your Privilege. It's uh, povfilm.org slash check your privilege check dash your dash privilege this is a website and it is about um well it's about bringing diversity to uh to entertainment but here's what here's what i'll say this was played during a hockey game in canada and a person from canada a guy named alec just sent this to me he said um this is weird because let's um Let's let's just make a quick observation. Most people playing hockey, they're white. Most people playing basketball, the majority happen to be black. Most people playing in the NFL, happen, nobody cares. You know why? Because everyone that's there earned their position. They earned their place in athletics. So the fact that this was played during a hockey game in Canada is very interesting. We're going to play a, a short commercial here this trailer um it's brief and then we're going to discuss it on the back end alan if you'll mute me yes but check out this trailer and then we will discuss i just find it somewhat hypocritical it was played during a hockey game in canada here we go This is the office of Todd Hammersfield. And like most of Canada's film and media industries, Todd Studio is mostly straight and white. Todd tends to avoid that topic, but it's not Todd's fault. Todd didn't personally spend the last century making it nearly impossible for BIPOC and LGBTQ plus folk to pursue careers in this industry, or at least I don't think Todd did. Did you, Todd? But he did benefit from the structure, and that's why we need Todd's help now. By pledging to check their privilege, Todd Studio can now help fund programs to finally create a more diverse talent pool. And Todd, you can stop hiding behind this plan. What? Actually, <laughs> I'm in the vents. Oh. Oh. oh! There you are. I was looking all over for you. Stop hiding from our industry's lack of diversity and pledge to help POV fix it. Go to checkyourprivilege.ca. They, they don't, don't make, make vents like they used to. Uh okay. Uh, okay. No, that's <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's yeah, how um, far we've come. Couple couple things, couple things I want to say about this, and you will leave a link to the website in the description. 
Um, want to say a couple things about this one, the way that she delivers the line, most are straight and white. The implication is those things are bad. This is all leading to a bad place. This, and this is not, you know what? You can find a ton of videos like this enough. No one is stopping any person of color from starting their own company and doing their own thing and hiring whoever the hell they want. But this implication that that's a bad thing is only going to lead to a bad place. Now, um, th the other thing is, is that, that just the idea that it, it it's diminishing also to um, anyone that's so-called in the quote, people of color category that they need help only from a straight white person, straight white male. Like that's first of all, one that that's bad. And two, it's like, well, the only way to get ahead is if they help me, you don't need their help. F them. Go do your own thing. Start your own company, make your independent film, start an agency where you do after do whatever you want. But this, this is that you should be offended by this. Everyone should be offended by this. Because my whole barometer for racism is very simple. If you reverse it and say, well, a straight black man, how does that sound? I just saying it out loud sounds awful to me. And so it should sound awful to you. Alan, what are your thoughts? <laughs> my thoughts, uh, I wasted my life uh, trying to be qualified to do the jobs I got hired for. Um, you know, I... I waste all that time in college trying to learn business so I can get a marketing job. Uh, I should have just gone in and applied for it and then just have it be given to me. Um, sure. I wouldn't have done as well as I would have, but uh, I would have at least gotten the job. I, uh, you know, I talked about, you know, my first job interview out of college was uh, the Walt Disney company uh, interviewed at the Walt Disney studios for an accounting job. And uh, I didn't get the job, and and I'll tell you exactly why I didn't get the job because I was a marketing major and I wanted to do marketing. I didn't want to do accounting, and they asked me, "So you know, you're applying for this accounting job, yet you're a marketing major," and uh, and they soon realized that uh, I wasn't right for the accounting job, and so I didn't get it. Had I just thrown the race card in, uh, I think I probably could have gotten that job, uh, or should have gotten that job. That's the better way of saying it. Um, you know, it's just. Uh, you know, it's this whole video just watching is so demeaning because it's like, you know, you, you know, I, we live in this era. We've, I've always lived in this era where you, uh, you strive for the job that you want. You, you learn, you get trained. Uh, and here is just that, uh, no, just give it to whoever, you know, give it to someone who's not white and who's not male. And, uh, you know, the, the ultimate goal is diversity, uh, you know, you know, you just want a rainbow, a rainbow staff to, to do the job. Uh, and, and it's never the thought of, Hey, um, how are we going to make money to keep this business afloat? You know, that Look, was, always I, I, I think the more different voices, the better, but you can do that without diminishing or insulting certain types of people. This is insulting. Yeah. It well, needs to be everybody. called out. And people need to start to speak up. This is not helping things. It creates division, resentment, and even like a que questioning, like, am I really qualified or did I just get hired because of what I look like or my sexuality? No one should feel that way. This, this approach to solving a, pro solving a problem that was going away for the most part organically is, is this is the wrong approach. And I'm, I, I, I just, I'm tired of the division yeah. that there is so much division that's being sowed uh, between um, genders, even right. Men, women, and between different, whatever ethnicities. I just, I'm so over it. The fact yeah. that more people are not outraged that's the thing that that uh, I find disconcerting. Well, you, you say that it's insulting. Thing. You say that it's insulting to a certain group of people. It, the reality is, it's insulting to everybody. Yes. Uh, 
you know, it's insulting to you by, by saying that, uh, that because of your skin color and where you grew up, that, that you are have privilege and you're not deserving of this job. And at the same time, uh, it, it presumes that everyone else, minorities, uh, are not capable of holding these jobs, of being trained and being able to, you know, you know to earn these jobs. Uh, the, you know, when we talked about the defiles, uh, you know, there are plenty of minority animators, storytellers, directors, and so on at Disney. The problem is, is those aren't the ones that they're hiring. They're hiring this new generation of activists to take those roles. And, and you know, and, and it just shows you that they're not interested in your your skin color. They're not interested in your culture. Uh, they're interested in just grifting, uh, as as we are saying here. Um, you know, it, it just... Oh, it, look, I've been doing... I'll go to my improv comedy. Uh, I travel to San Diego uh, twice a month to uh, to do improv comedy. And, and the reason I don't go to Hollywood to do it or stay in Orange County and do it is because it's all crap. You know, I, I spent my life, uh, I spent a huge chunk of my life perfecting or understanding what, what I like in improv comedy and, and doing it. And uh, found a group that that accepted that and, and, uh, and it worked with them. You know, they had the same ideas that I did. And that's why I travel so much. But, you know, there have been times where early on where there were just I didn't see many Asian improvisers. And when I did, it was just like, oh, OK, you know, you've got a ways to go. And and the, the whole point that I'm making is, is that I've always been, you know, the, this idea of excellence, it has always been instilled in me that that you're not, you know, don't ever accept being the token, uh, except being the best. And go out and do the best you can. And that's those are kind of the jobs and things that I've pursued. And uh, we don't celebrate excellence anymore. We don't encourage excellence anymore. Uh, we just want to fill roles and hope that people can do the best they can. And it's just not going to happen. It, it the, the results are what we're getting today. You know. Let's go to your chat comments and questions. Uh, starting with the super chats here from D Irishman for 19. D Irishman 1998. For four nine nine, your Oscar stream was with the mo was the most fun stream I've ever seen. Shout out to Alan for reading my non super chats. Thanks y'all for all you do. And Topher, thank you. Appreciate that. We'll be do we do watch parties. You know, it's it's a lot of fun. Topher Gooch, I think that's correct. Dei can die. Well, uh, many would agree with you. Hi Kira for $5 says I'm 35 years overdue for my white privilege paycheck from these weirdos say I should have gotten. Yeah. It's, um, it's a white privilege paycheck. I, the, the whole white privilege now has become a myth because it's not about that anymore. At least when you look today, uh, mm -hmm. you, you might as well just say, uh, we're not interested in hiring any white people. And, um, yeah. I think that's racist could be illegal. Who knows, but it's happening. You can't say it's not happening anymore from rumble caveat ties. Sub supporter for two says they don't make vents like they used to because they lowered the standards for vent makers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We saw what happened to Todd, uh, Roberto <laughs> Sabato for 100 Swedish Krona. Thank you for that. I urge people to stop using the term by POC BIPOC. It's their label and don't give them an inch. Not all people of different ethnic backgrounds are the same. There you go. And uh, Peter Rossi just says it's a good way to go out of business. And yep. from Rumble, Adel is 24, says entitled. So you're in, you're, I, Alan, I you're, in, titled, you're yeah. entitled, Alan. Yeah. Um, and Mac Based Man for 499 says, I'm surprised they had Todd fall out of event rather than just finding him in the closet. That could have happened. All right. Time to pivot. Let's talk about let's talk about Immaculate, starring Sydney Sweeney. Uh, Sydney Sweeney plays a woman named Cecilia. She is a uh, devout uh, of she's devout of faith. She is coming from America to the Italian countryside, where she's she's become a nun. What a waste. Well, yes. Like, I don't know. First of all, the Italian countryside, um, very interesting. She would choose that as a place to escape America. 
Um, I'm going to show you a little bit here where you can actually get a taste of the movie and the tone. This is like an old school horror film from the 1970s. It's a lot like The Devils. If you've ever heard of a film called The Devils, really great horror film from 1971. Not sure if uh, anyone remembers that, but me. It's a very good horror film. Uh, and it was uh, directed by Ken Russell. Great horror movie. This is in that vein. And Immaculate, while she's at this, this, uh, you know, at, at this, you know, in the Italian countryside, she starts to have some weird dreams, which suddenly lead to her becoming pregnant. Immaculate conception, who knows? She then has to deal with the pregnancy and everyone at, 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 at all the nuns being just, you know, amazed that he is coming. Who is he? Something good or something evil? Um, Sydney Sweeney was, again, this is through her production company. She was very involved um, in, in the making of this. A lot of really good jump scares. It is a religious horror film. 90 minutes. It's a tight 90 minutes. I'll just say the movie does a really good job of escalating the stakes. Uh, and everything I talk about of her becoming pregnant, in, in the that's all in the trailer. But who is she pregnant by? Why is she pregnant? And what is she about to give birth to? So part of this is a little body horror. I will say there are some pretty gory parts that made me turn away. Some really good jump scares. And an ending. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you. The ending is a shocker ending. And uh, I, I, I can't say anything more than that. All I'll say is if you can, if you, if you like horror that involves a little bit of religion, um, it's got sort of like maybe aspects of almost you could think of this. Uh, I don't want to say. But it's, but it's in that realm of like other films that have explored this territory. She's fantastic in it. Uh, for those that are probably going to ask before you ask, yes, she doesn't get naked in the movie. There's implied nudity. There's implied nudity. And there is something she wears that's kind of sheer where she may as well um, be nude. Now, the screening I was at, she happened to be there for the screening. Her father was there. And what she told a really cool story you can uh, watch in the video for members. Um, she told a really cool story about how her dad showed her all these horror movies when she was way too young and she just sort of like rolled with it. But you can tell she had her father seemed to have a really good influence on her as a kid in terms of just introducing her to really good movies. So, so, uh, Shout out to Sidney Sweeney's dad, I guess. Um, I feel like uh, he's an important part of her life and she has a healthy view of entertainment. And I will say there are some action scenes in the third act where you're on the edge of your seat. Um, I recommend it. Um, I would say it's probably a six and a half uh, out of 10 for me. So, which is like a, a good, it's good. Is it great? Well, uh, but a really good horror film and uh, perfect running time in 90 minutes. And Sydney Sweeney is not bad to look at uh, for that length of time. Uh, I'll say that the horror really is like those wind up horror where you're about to see something happen, really leaning into good use of sound and tone. And it's kind of a, an ode back to like old uh, horror films from the 1970s, in particular, uh, The Devils. Uh, if you're familiar with that movie. So I recommend it, but again, six and a half out of 10 um, and, and uh, not the best horror film I've seen this year, but worth checking out. Uh, there you go. Alan, any thoughts or questions? Uh, yeah. Well, you know how I feel about horror movies, so I'm probably not going to see it. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. But but the other thing, uh, Madam Webb is a great advertisement for this movie. <laughs> You know, it's yeah. she's become that person who's uh, who's found a way to make lemons, uh, uh, make lemonade out of lemons, uh, or turn lemons into lemonade. Well, the director uh, that she worked with, the director, his name is Michael Mohan. He's worked mm -hmm. with him a couple times. Um, he's he really seem they seem to have like a good working relationship. Mm -hmm. There is something to um, 
talent and people behind the camera that like working together. They vibe. Um, one thing just to make sure that we get to this, um, Sydney Sweeney knows her audience. Let's take a look at what she was wearing at the premiere. I'm just going to go through a couple of these pics here real quickly. Um, you know, well, there, this Ooh. is Sweeney at the immaculate Ooh. premiere. Again, nuns, these are nuns that have like these red faces. By the way, those nuns walked up Hollywood Boulevard and people kept yelling at them, which I thought was really <laughs> weird. But here she is at the premiere. Look, she knows how to sell a movie. So yeah. kudos to her for that. And um, and there you go. Her relationship with Michael Mohan, uh, I think I think that they really vibe well together. So uh, good for her. Good for her. Yeah. Um, I mean, she knows how to market herself. Uh, you know, the, yeah. she's doing all the right things here in, in terms of uh, anyone but you and this movie. Uh, you know, it, it, I don't think we've said anything really glowing about those two movies, but uh, it was certainly popular enough to make make people a lot of money, especially herself. Yeah. So, uh, by the uh, way, Immaculate is out in theaters Friday, the same day as Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Friday, March 22nd, probably see a, a preview show on Thursday. Yeah. Oh, I, I think the point I'm making here is, you know, if if you're an actor who wants to do this for a living, uh, follow her example. You don't have to have her body, but you can have her attitude when it comes to making movies, promoting movies and and uh, and the movies that you choose. And uh, there's certainly a winning combination there. You know, don't don't treat us like we're we're the enemy. Uh, there's a level of gratitude I sense from her. Uh, there's a lot of self-awareness that I think people really need. Uh, you know, there, it is possible to make it, still make it in Hollywood today. And I think she's kind of going down the right path at the moment. Uh, you know, maybe maybe there's an Oscar winning performance down the road, uh, far down the road. But no, you know, no, no, no. It. Let me stop you right there. We're okay. going to go to, let me stop you right there. She is one of the rare talents. Mm -hmm. He is thinking about the audience. Who else does that? Tom Cruise. Her agenda in her head is my job is to entertain the audience so that they will pay money to see me, uh, to see light and sound dance. Okay. To go see the movie. That is her number one role. And I believe having seen her choices, uh, the film, anyone but you, um, she, keeps the audience in mind. I feel like there's certain people in entertainment. I think Ryan Gosling is also one of those people who's like, I'm thinking of the, what the audience wants. That's yeah. the only thing that matters. That's yeah, the only the, thing that matters. But the thing that, that I'll say about this is, uh, you know, there are a lot of actors who do this, but they make a lot of these movies that, that have appeal uh, and that makes them enough money to be able to make a movie that they're passionate about, that they don't necessarily care about whether you know it's going to make a lot of money but it's the performance of their lifetime you know and and i think she can she can definitely head in that direction she'll make enough hits to be able to make a movie that's very personal to her yeah. uh, and uh you know and i say go for it absolutely go for it all right and let's go to your you comment oscar, if it wins you an oscar then, then all, all the better all right let's go to your comments and questions here starting with thomas pickett for five says equality sounds good but once you think about it, it isn't. Some people are special. A lot are average and a few are awful. I would say most are average. That's how the bell curve works. Well, it's the idea of knowing who you are, what your talents are, and finding the role that fits those talents. Not everyone's going to be an actor. Not everyone's going to be a football player. Uh, you know, and, and your skin color should not uh, be the the door to get you into a job that you're not qualified for. I put something in the chat. Uh, just keep going with these comments. We have a lot to cover today. Just a reminder. We have a lot to cover today. So let's go through this. Right. Lori Ormond says member for 12 months. I think my white privilege card got lost in the mail. I need to inquire with John Stewart and Thomas Pickett back with another super chat here for two says, and where are the pool nuns? Yes. Paul, uh, Apollos plane became a YouTube member and from rumble a Dell is 24. Is it the, is it in the realm of Paul Verhoeven's Benedetta? I have not seen that. Uh, red French moon for five euros. I liked anyone, but you, 
And I like that she has her own production company. She can have a say in the stories and her career. It's better than getting mad at fans. And Script Doctor is here and says, from what I hear about her, Sydney Sweeney is going to become a full-time producer in 10 years. The next Lauren Schuler Donner is in the talk. That makes so much mm -hmm. sense. So I like that. And uh, the Raven King says, I had no ideas. Sydney Sweeney was that little girl in the John Carpenter, the ward. I don't know what that is. The ward. Okay. Some of these comments, let's keep them on focus. And if I don't understand it, you probably don't either. Gifted five film threat memberships. Justin Martins did that. And I say, thank you. And let's, oh, here we go. Sweet, Paulus playing for a hundred Swedish Corona. Sweet Baby Inc. Detected has 307,000, uh, over 307,000 curator followers with love from Norway. Dudes, not North Korea dollars. It's Swedish Krona, right? Am I Swedish Krona? I got that or right. Norwegian. Right? Norwegian. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. Norwegian. My apologies. All right. And thank you for those gifted memberships. And thanks for the people who are now new members. We got to pivot. All right, Alan. It's time for us to discuss the first <laughs> three episodes of X-Men 97. They have dropped. It's on Disney Plus. This is the sequel um, directly, not 100% directly, but it's uh, uh, the end of uh, the final season of the X-Men cartoon show. Professor X says, quote, died, not really, but we won't get into that. And um, this, this carries on the story from those original X-Men cartoons. I say this as I'm wearing... Scott Summers glasses. These are Oakley reproductions, which were put out in 2000 when uh, the first X-Men movie hit. Was it 2000? Right around there. Around there, yeah. Around there. James Marsden wore these. This is the most I have ever spent on a pair of sunglasses. 300 bucks for a pair of Oakleys. In Yeah, in that day and age. Uh, I still have them. I've, I've never spent more on a pair of sunglasses than that. But um, I was looking forward to this. and. I, I don't even know how to say this. And obviously we're going to stick, stick spoiler free. We will watch all the episodes and do a final roundup. Once Alan and I have seen all of them, it's fine. It's good. It's a couple. Let's start with things I like and things I didn't like. And then Alan, I want to hear from you. Okay. So things I liked it. It was sort of an up. Obviously the older episodes are in standard def. These are in like full, you know, HD. They look really great. They are in the style of the old 90s show. So it's like you could, you know, watch those and then watch the newer ones. So it matches. Secondly, it also, the music, they beefed up the theme at the beginning, which I think is iconic, right? When you just hear those few notes, you know what it is. Um, the characters seem to be pretty, pretty much matching, you know, the old school show. Um, and it, it seems in tone like a 90s cartoon show. I, I was, and, and a lot of the things that happen are obviously right ripped out of the comics. I, I, I like some things. And then there are like little things that are like nitpicks, which are like, Oh, they had to do that. Or, Oh, they had to do this. There's an implication in the first episode that one of the characters, um, who is like, it's like a, an, an illegal immigrant, right? There's a little bit of that in there. And there are these extremists that are trying to get, the illegal immigrant, which is a, they, you know, they, they gloss over, this is the thing, all these little nitpick things that are kind of annoying, they just gloss over them quickly. So you're like, wait, what? And uh, if you don't blink, there are two women kissing in a club. <laughs> um, there's just a lot of little things like that. And then Magneto in, I think this is in the third episode, gives a speech to the UN where he says, you should be able to love whoever you want to love. Right. It's all this like, so it's like any of the so-called messaging that you would see, it's just, it goes by so quick. You're like, wait, what? So, but it doesn't, it, the one thing is it doesn't push it hard. It's there. There's not very much of it. So it's okay. I'm not going to, a lot of people are going to review this and say it's a complete disaster. It's not a complete disaster. I'll just say it's not a complete disaster. 
but it's not the greatest thing ever. I will say this. It'll probably get you, if you're a fan of the show when it first came out and you see this, it, 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 you're you're, you're going to get. I think feel like you might get taken you get in. Feel. Yeah, you'll get the feels. Alan, were, were, what you, are your were you a fan of this show when it first came out? No, because I wasn't the right age. Yeah. I was okay. doing adult things, and I would watch it, and I'm like, oh, that's fine, because I yeah. like because why? I love the X Men characters. Jean Grey. I like the old school, right? I like, I, I love the characters. I care about what happens to those characters. Mm -hmm. And there are so many great X-Men characters. You could rebuild the Marvel Cinematic Universe just with X-Men movies. Just make X-Men movies. You can have this character, these characters go off and do an adventure. You have Gambit, Gambit do his own, own movie. You could do, you, that's how you, re, you could rebuild Marvel with Fantastic Four and X-Men. There are enough characters and story. And and just do that rather than going with your B characters, like, and no disrespect to Eternals or other characters from Marvel, but um, I just, I just think that X-Men is just really uh, just resonates with everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, un unfortunately, you know, certain communities say that, Oh, this is about this. No, it's not. It's about anyone that feels like a misfit. Yeah. Anyone Awkward. that feels out of place. Everyone has that feeling. Every that is what it means to be human. It's a part of humanity. You feel out of place. You don't feel like you belong. That is everyone, and that's why the appeal of X Men is so universal. Alan, I'm sorry. All right. I really want to hear what you think. Yeah. You know the comics. You know the X Men. I comics. do know the comics. I mean, my I know the entry early comics, not the old, not the newer ones. Right. My my entry into comic books was X Men. Uh, it was the John Byrne. It was the Hellfire Club. It was uh, right before the death of Phoenix. That's when I got into comic books. Um, look, I, I'll I'll be the heretic here. Uh, I was never a fan of the of the X Men television series. I saw a couple episodes. Uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be openly I'll be open and honest. Uh, I just don't like the animation style, and uh, this mm. is a continuation of that. Uh, when you compare it to Batman, the Batman, the animated series, Batman is so much better in terms of animation. And if I wasn't uh, such a Marvel guy, uh, I might have liked the Batman animated series uh, a lot. Um, I just don't like the style. I, you know, and I and I'll say this from from that era to now, I've never been impressed with Marvel, Marvel animation. And so I, you know, I, I kind of come to this with uh, with just not. I was just never excited about the series when it when I saw it. Um, you know, a lot of it, me watching it was, okay, it's not bad. And the, um, you know, the the little things they sneak in here and there, you know, you can just kind of expect it. Uh, I was not blown away. Uh, I was I was as blown away with this series as I was with the original, um, which was not very blown away. Um, and, I, and I'll give you, and, and story-wise, I will tell you uh, that because I grew up with the John Byrne, uh, uh, Dave Cockrum uh, X-Men, um, I've always found the series itself uh, to be kind of toned down kids' versions of those very adult stories. And um, and I certainly got that with this one. Um, you know, the first one was I, I, I Sunspot's origin, you know, Sunspot joining the team. Uh, then it was uh, Magneto taking over uh, the X-Men uh, in place of Charles Xavier. And then you have uh, the third episode, which no one has seen yet except us, but it's the uh, uh, Sinister, Mr. Stennis Sinister. Is that the guy's name? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, and it has to do with uh, Gene's pregnancy. Um, you know, it, it's, it was, it was okay. It, but it was always, it, it all felt like kids retellings of very dark stories. Um, and so, you know, it, it, the best I could say is I, I, what it felt like ultimately this series was an attempt to recreate the nostalgia of the original series. And when you do that, when you, when you have to recreate something you were never a part of it, it never felt authentic, um, or felt less than authentic. Uh, like they were just trying to be nostalgic for nostalgia's sake. And, and I would much rather have them told, um, you know, use better animation, use better technology and and be able to push stories a, a little bit further than they did here. And so, you know, I I don't I don't I don't dislike this show for the obvious reasons. Uh, I just 
I'm, I'm just not a big fan of this because of what it is and the style of animation. So uh, I'm just not blown away. And, uh, you know, and, and I think I only saw this because, you know, because we were talking about it today and we got early access. So that's my feeling. Uh, well, look, I'll just say this. I, I, I don't know that this is necessarily made for us, right? Like it's, and I don't think it was made for us back then either. Uh, we're no, too no, old. It's, it's, it, let's, let's actually be really honest. The show was made to sell toys. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and and shout out to Toy Biz for that. They did a great job on those toys back then. It's for kids. And I think, it, I actually think they deserve a little bit of credit for taking some stories that could be kind of for adults. And they sort of did the kids versions of them. I feel like, like when you look at like your life as a fan, right? There are things that are like, you know, they make stuff that's like for kids and then they move up and you kind of move up the scale to the things that are more adult. And those kids will be interested at some point when they're ready to read the original stories as they are in the comics. And I think that that's fine. I yeah. applaud that. I applaud that. Yeah. I mean, were the Morlocks a part of the original series? Because they, they kind of make an appearance in this series. But I remember the Morlock story. I, I love the Morlock story, uh, especially the demise of Angel. Um, but you know they're not going to tell that story in in this series. Um, right. But you know there was that attempt, and and uh, you know, again, you, you just said it. it. It wasn't made for us. And you know when when it came out in the nineties, it was still not made for us at that time. Right. We're too old. We're too damn old. No, but that's that's okay. Like there, uh, look, it's weird because there are lapses in my pop culture knowledge, mm -hmm. and usually it comes from life. Life stuff happens, right? Yeah. Work stuff is crazy. Or when I was raising my kids when they were a certain age, you know, your attention is, is put elsewhere. Your attention is elsewhere specifically because life things happen. Um, I think it's fine. It's not a disaster. It's just okay. Mm -hmm. But if you were a fan of the old show, you're an actual fan of the old show. I think you're going to find a lot to like, um, at the very least the opening title sequence with the music yeah is it's it's pretty cool to see it like with a budget and you know the, the, <laughs> the uh, music not done like kind of cheesy sounding so yeah so there you go yeah i um, i do appreciate though that they made uh, jubilee look more asian in this so yeah <laughs> for no the longest that's time, for the longest it, time i never knew she was asian <laughs> yeah and and for those uh putting out the criticism that the show isn't um, the sort of sexy bodies that were in the show. Wait until you get to episode three. There is um, there is something that happens in episode three of X Men '97, and uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, they knew how they know how to do sexy women. Yeah, they, oh, I, you, I think you mean Jean Grey psychic boob job? Is that the one you're talking? Yeah, about? that's pretty much what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, let's lean into that. <laughs> Uh, don't tell me you weren't looking at her Sweeney's. <laughs> there you go. Let's go to your comments and questions here. Um, starting with the super chat here from Taylor Gentry for 499 says, it worries me you compared Immaculate to the Devils. Lol, is it as blasphemous? I can't say. Mm. I can't do spoilers and I can't say. Uh, okay. Why do you think I compare? Let's just yeah, move on from that. Taylor Thank you for the super chat. Uh, the Drifter 67 says, I watched the original X-Men. I have some of those old 90s figures. I still have the first Deadpool figure made. Hang on to it. And from North Jersey, the X-Men cartoon was always campy and crappy. You can tell if it is good or not with X-Men by Wolverine's costume. If it is yellow and blue, the property is going to suck. Accident seller for 50 uh norwegian krona norwegian krona thank you as a fan connoisseur and loving enthusiast of shapely female backside how does the woman's women's glute glute five look in x-men 97 especially rogues i didn't notice rogue but gene gray Jean Grey got back. That's all I got to say. Um, but you don't see it until the third episode. But here's my problem with everything Disney. Everything Disney tends to start out really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you get past the first few episodes 
and then it just completely poops the bed at the end. That's almost everything Disney. Yeah. Everything Disney. They, they give us the right amount of episodes to watch ahead of time, and then they screw it up on the back end. Speaking of yeah. back end. Speaking of back end, what are you talking about? <laughs> All right. Just, yeah. Uh, we can go down the list. I'll right. be right back. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, let's. Uh, okay. Actually, we're out of we're out of things here. Uh, okay. Yeah, if you could help me uh, star some of these things, that would be great. I'm just going to randomly choose things here. Uh, Cassigan says they reused the Ewok village for the Prince of Thieves toys. Um, yeah, isn't she? Okay. Yeah, isn't she pregnant? Jean Grey is pregnant in this one, and. Uh, the third episode kind of uh, uh, kind of gives us the uh, the uh, that that's the main storyline of uh, of what happens to the baby. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Uh, the Raven King. The word was John Carpenter's last movie uh, that he directed, if I believe. All right. I I don't think I've I know I haven't seen that one, so she may be in there. Um, let me see. The other thing is, you know, speaking of Rogue, I don't know. Is it me or I just, she seemed cooler in the comic books than she did in the series. Uh, again, I might be blasphemous here because I didn't watch the whole series, but uh, I did read uh, Rogue's kind of turn toward the good side in X-Men. Uh, you know, that was probably the only good Captain Marvel story or Ms. Marvel story I've ever read. Um, here we go. Uh, from Joseph. So, X-Men 97 gets a thumbs up, one thumbs up and one thumbs down from Film Thread. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's the hype that, that concerns me. Uh, when I'm watching this, I'm like, you know, you kind of wanted to see, to be blown away with this. Uh, and rather, and instead of being blown away, I kind of felt like I just got a continuation of what I didn't like about the original series. Uh, Brock Samsonite, an Asian girl with firework power, <laughs> sounds kind of racist. Disney, um, yeah. Here we go. Uh, from Kali Kalichi Oki, uh, the opening title sequence is pretty much the same from the original. They didn't even change it. Well, they added '97 to the back end of X Men. That's how it changes. Uh, you are back. I'm back. Okay, uh, from Steve Lorney. Stephen Lorney, it's pulling the nostalgia strings hard. Uh, forget about it, haha. I, to me, that's the that's the problem I have with this, is that uh, you know, again, Disney. No one, not just Disney, but no, they they always have to uh, redo rehash old things. I, I kind of likened it, to, especially with the Al 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 acolyte. It's the idea that Disney has to come into your your bedroom. And tell you you've been playing with your toys wrong. You know, they're taking everything we loved in the past and said, nope, what you were playing with was completely wrong. And here's the way you should be playing with your toys. And uh, that's the most insulting thing about all this. That's my biggest problem with all these redos is that uh, they, they feel like they're improving it when all they're doing is changing it for, for the sake of the message. All right. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can. Okay, we gotta okay. move on. We don't have time. I I need everyone to try to keep up with me. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> I got. You saw the list of things I'm trying to do today. That's why we gotta keep things. We gotta like wrap up comments quick. Yes. Um, I like having a bunch of comments, but I might not get to them all, and I'm sorry about that. My apologies to everyone for that. But I have something that I wanna. Yeah, I'm in a rush. Joseph, I'm in a rush trying to entertain you. We also have an interview at the end of the show about a, a documentary coming out, but there you go. All right. So there you go. We got a lot. So don't be sorry about anything. Andrew Cram. Be sorry, Chris. It's all good. I had an energy drink, of course. No, I just, yeah. here we go, folks. Here we go. Are we ready? Uh, almost ready to talk about the subject. <laughs> half a, you keep you keep wanting to move forward and then you bow out. Did anyone? <laughs> did anyone notice I changed my shirt? Do you know why I changed my shirt? 
because I got this stuff all over. Oh, <laughs> gee, okay. I can't. I got to talk to you. I can't go from one show to the next show. I need a little bit of a break to go to the bathroom and eat something. I've had nothing today but th but this. Don't feel sorry for me, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Do not feel sorry. Way, for this, you. this next. I'm just saying. I just need a little, just a little bit, just the time to go to the bathroom. Just saying. This I'm, next topic is all you. That's why it's not like I. Can no, I need you, Alan. I know you need me, but it's not like I. I'm the one to transition into it. Yeah. Uh, did you Kirk yourself? No, <laughs> I just I got stuff all over my other shirt, so I had to change my shirt. Yeah. Don't worry, man. It's kind of like are people saying yeah. sorry. It's all good, man. Uh, yeah. Wednesday's five hours of me. I know. Um, there you go. Okay. Hey, what about that sweet baby ink? We're going to get to it, but we're going right. to get to it. We're going to get to it by an odd thing. I need you just to, I need to tell my story. Tell your story. Before we talk about sweet baby ink, give you a little history of censorship in gaming. I'll start with my personal background. I have always been a gamer. Uh, first game I ever played was my father took me to work and I played a text-based Star Trek game. And all I remember was feeling elated when the text came up, you have left dry dock on the Starship Enterprise. That led to buying an old game system at a yard sale where you had to tape clear, transparent color onto a black and white TV so you could play tennis, which was basically Pong. Since then, I played the Odyssey 2, which was a game that had a Star Wars game. I think it was called Space War that had ships shaped like TIE fighters. And it had a keyboard. It was the only game system that came with a keyboard. Look up the Odyssey 2. Since then, I've had every major game system. Sega Genesis, Super NES, where I played games like Earthbound. Where I played games like uh, Batman. Uh, where I played a lot of different games going through every, I had a 3DO, I had a Philips CDI, I had the Sega Saturn, I had the Dreamcast, name the game system I had. I waited in line 18 hours to get a an Xbox 360 in 2005. That's when HDTVs first came out. But what a lot of people don't know about me is that I was the editor of a video game magazine in the 1990s called Video Games Magazine. I was at that magazine for uh, years. And in addition to doing Film Threat was like my side job. And I actually made a living working in video game magazines. Video game. This is uh, one of the issues, the earlier issues of Video Game Magazine from the 90s. Here, here you go. Uh, that's me. Uh, I, we would write editorials every issue. And video games, we covered everything. All sorts of types of gaming. That even branched off into different types of magazines, including Computer Player. Some people might remember that. Computer Player covered you know, uh, computer games and CD-ROM games, which were new at the time. There was even a magazine called Tips and Tricks that spun off. From all of that, Tips and Tricks, Ultimate Gamer, among others. Now, the big ones in the field that always kicked our butt was EGM. I loved EGM. EGM was great. It had attitude. These magazines didn't have quite as much attitude, but we had a lot of fun doing them. But at the time, which a lot of people don't remember, there was a lot of battles about violence in video games. Let me get right to it. I'm going to be presenting some screens here. And I'm just going to start to show you some of this stuff. Because you think that Sweet Baby Inc. is the company that's this new thing. And, and, and they're, they're changing parts of games to the point where gamers don't like them. Back in the 90s, the U.S. government held, they had committees. And there were there were people in our government actively trying to stop video games from happening. Uh, quickly, just going to run you through and just sort of look at some of, um, you know, some of the covers of Video Games Magazine there, uh, just to give you a look at it. Let me add that there. 
Um, so there were just going to show you like some of the editorials and one in particular got me in trouble. And that's what I want to talk about. And what was weird was I was always getting in trouble when it came to film threat. And here I am doing effectively a video game magazine that's for children and still getting in trouble. A lot of trouble. Uh, we had a, um, we had an editorial where, where I would write a little editorials, video games versus real life. That was one topic. Another topic. I'll just show you, we, we, you know, uh, another topic here. Um, this is winter CES 94. That's how long ago this was. So that's 30 years ago, cutting through the hype. We had our little screen with the editors where we we're all kind of characters. And I wasn't the only one that wrote editorials for the magazine, which was a lot of fun, but I got myself in trouble when I wrote about fighting video games. And here's what happened. A guy named Daniel Lundgren, who was the attorney general of the state of California, sent a warning to the video game industry. He sent a letter. I'm going to read parts of it. He sent a letter to the video game industry and effectively said, if you do not, um, I'll read the quote, either remove the needless violence from the games or remove the games from the market. He was threatening this attorney general of the state of California who had ambitions to actually be the governor of the state of California, a Democrat, I might add, was looking to remove games from the market. And he sent out this letter. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. All of this is going to make sense uh, in a second. But I need to read this to you. I am writing you today to ask you to stop the manufacturing, licensing, distribution, or sale of any video game that portrays graphic and gratuitous violence, including but not limited to the games Mortal Kombat and Night Trap. Night Trap, created by a company called Digital Pictures. I'll get to that. Put a pin in it. Let me, let, uh, let me be clear. I am not proposing legislation, government regulation, or litigations to curtail the availability of these video games. Instead, I am appealing to your sense of corporate and personal responsibility. Oh, what does that sound like to you? Sounds a little sweet baby to me. Either remove the needless violence from the games or remove the games from the market. Never before has our society seen such gruesome acts of violence committed by youths at younger and younger ages, the number of juveniles arrested for murder in the United States increased 119% between 1986 and 1991. Here in California, the number of juvenile arrests for murder increased over 136% during the same period. Continual exposure to violent images and themes in various entertainment may not be the direct result to direct cause of these atrocious acts, but interactive video games, which promote violence, uh, do have deadening desensitizing impact on young impressionable youth. Studies of both television and video game exposure have found that violent video games encourage aggressive activity and antisocial behavior. For example, a 1987 national coalition on television violence study found that violent video games lead to more aggressive behavior by children. The message conveyed to our children by these violent video games is that the only way to win or be successful and obtain power is to demean and destroy opponents while stripping away their humanity. I am particularly disturbed by the fact that many new video games are more realistic in their portrayal of graphic violence and other adult oriented themes. This trend ignores the industry's own statistic that approximately 70% 70, 70 of all video games are owned by children. Leadership comes from the top. And that is why I am, I am calling upon you and other industry leaders to remove the needless violence in your company's video games or withdraw uh, or, or excuse me, or withdraw them from the market. Basically saying, take your games off the shelf. Let's all explore new ways to challenge, educate, and entertain our youth rather than going for the cheap 
mindless, misleading, and dangerous thrill of video game violence. I look forward to your reply and consideration of this matter. Sincerely, Daniel E. Lundgren, Attorney General, State of California. I responded to his, uh, this was a letter that was sent to everyone, myself included. Okay, so I received a copy of this letter. It was sent out to the media and it was sent to every other video game publication at the time in the 90s. I responded, I don't know if you can see this, I responded by running a graphic of Daniel Lundgren's head on a finishing move from Mortal Kombat. Can you see that, Alan? Yes, thank you. And in it, I respond, I respond, here we go. Video Games Magazine responds, I'm going to have to blow this up. Dear Mr. Lundgren, a lot of politicians tend to jump on the bandwagon with these causes for their own political gain. And I notice an election is just around the corner. However, I appreciate your concerns regarding kids and violent video games. I happen to be a father myself, but I'd rather have my child acting out fantasies with a controller than with a fist or a real gun. It could be argued this kind of release is actually a healthy thing for all young people. And I'll bet I could quote some prestigious study that backs up this claim. While our government continues to blame popular entertainment for the world's problems, we are never offered why positive solution. We are never offered any positive solutions by our government leaders other than to censor or ban the product. That's just too simple. I personally believe the decline of our youth has more to do with a poor educational system and deterioration of the family than video games. The state of the American school system is at an embarrassing all time low and your efforts uh, to attack the video game industry divert attention from your institution's own shortcomings. Why not rally our industry around a positive cause? A computer on every child's desktop by the year 2000? That's something I'm sure the video game industry could get behind. Efforts to censor popular forms of media have come and gone. Here's a short list. Comic books, Seduction of the Innocent, a book published in the 1950s, argued that Mad Magazine and horror comics were the downfall of our youth. This upset politicians so much that it led to Senate hearings on the issue. Surprisingly, this generation survived. Rock and roll has received a constant harassment by elected officials since its birth. It's funny to note that President Bill Clinton likes it. Rap ditto. Movies, Sylvester Stallone's Rambo films upset parents groups everywhere. However, the early 80s generation that grew up on these flicks seems okay. So far, television. For television, Married with Children continues to ruin the lives of millions of children at 9 p.m. every Sunday night, despite efforts by Michigander Terry Ricolta to have it taken off the air. A lot of people don't remember that Terry Ricolta. Entertainers. Elvis's gyrating crotch region almost kept him off television. And even religious leaders were against, uh, against him. Elvis later went on to record many inspirational gospel songs. And now he's on a U.S. postage stamp. Taking Mortal Kombat off, off the shelf is not going to suddenly stop violent acts by young people. But it's a foregone conclusion that in 30 or 40 years, there will be someone in the White House who has played video games. Going to be maybe even longer now. Uh, hopefully he or she will not have, uh, not have, uh, <laughs> hopefully, sorry, this is, hopefully he or <laughs> You wrote she, this. <laughs> I know, but it's it's on a terrible, if I showed you what this is. I know, I know. Hopefully she or he, uh, oh my God! Hopefully, she or he will have honed his or her problem-solving techniques from these challenging games. Perhaps this next generation will avoid blame and denial and take responsibility by looking for realistic solutions to our more serious problems. I signed it, your pal Chris Gore, editor in chief of Video Games Magazine. Now, here's what happened after that. And I need to apologize to our guests 
we're going to, this is going to be a lot longer. We're not going to get to the interview for probably another 15 minutes. If so, if you could be patient. Um, but here, here's here. Let me say what I did. So after this, I, I responded and apparently Dan Lundgren's nephew is a subscriber to video games magazine and saw this. So funny thing happened. He actually sent me a letter personally that funny enough, he actually sent to the media before he sent it to me. Of I then was in, I was in the wall street journal. I was in the New York times. I was in all because I was getting calls. I walk into work on a Friday afternoon and they're like, Hey, the New York times called. I'm like, wait, what? Uh, the LA Times called Wall Street Journal. This I'm like, what are you talking about? They said they're they want you to respond to the letter that Daniel Lundgren sent you. Suddenly, I'm in all these national papers. This is in 1995. It's around 95. Um, and I basically responded that button mashing doesn't win a fighting game in Mortal Kombat. When it comes to Mortal Kombat, the thing that wins the game is being very strategic. It's like a form of high-speed chess. So what, what, what I found disgusting was that this politician was using this issue as a way to uh, get attention so he could make a run for governor of the state of California. We fought all of this in the press, and this is something that people don't know because this was never in the press. I asked his press department, I said, look, could we just educate you about games? And to his credit, Daniel Lundgren actually came to the offices of Video Games Magazine. Uh, by the way, the day before, an advanced team came. Guys, I'm talking about like, they look like they're, uh, they're from, um, you know, the- Men in black. The, the men in black, like these scary guys with, you know, sung I mean, they're like scoping out the location because the attorney general was coming to our offices. And we had a very pleasant, not public conversation about video games. He mentioned that his nephew saw the image in the magazine. Um, I never apologized for what I did, but I stand by the fact that what games and video games are about, which is why they're so addicting and which why people love video games is because it's about problem solving because that's what it, it, innately as humans we love to problem solve. That's why different methods of education work better with kids than other types of, of education. One that asks questions rather than just memorize this and, and tell me that you memorized it. That doesn't work on kids. But if you present a problem to kids, they're innately interested in trying to figure it out. That's that's And all types, all video games are the same thing. It's solving a problem, whether it's a puzzle video game, whether it's a violent game, whether it's a hoppy jumpy side scroller, you have to solve a problem and the and 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 get past that. It's it's also could be a metaphor for life. So I've always been a gamer. It's not my first love. My first love is movies. I'd say literature and comic books and video games. But um, this experience taught me something. They're always going to vilify something. Mm -hmm. How does this tie into Sweet Baby? According to Paul Chato, government is still involved in helping support companies like Sweet Baby. And what I saw as that played out, I was blissfully unaware of Gamergate 1. It's, it's, and, and when I see the types of people that complain about stuff that they don't like, I just wait for them to go away. You saw in my editorial, I mentioned Terry Ricolta. I didn't even remember who that person was until I reread my editorial. Terry Ricolta was someone who actually tried to get the television show Married with Children off the air. Okay. Um, this is, you know, this is something that the problem has evolved. It's evolved into now companies doing this as a consulting, and it's very disconcerting. Um, Alan, before we pivot over to, uh, comments and sweet baby i want to hear your thoughts yeah i mean i barely remember this happening a while a long time ago but it's it's gone back to kind of what i've always said the the, the tactics of the conservatives back in the 80s and 90s they they seem to have trans uh, shifted over to the left and the woke movement 
and uh, and somehow is much more effective today than it was back then. But you're right in the sense of, uh, you know, the government seems to have this reason to want to uh, stifle anything that's fun. Uh, you mentioned, I think Tipper Gore was part of the uh, censoring, yes. you know, music uh, video games here. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just weird how things have just kind of come full circle and from the from the party that we never expected this to come from. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's just this fight for people who have, you know, the government sets itself up as to be our, our saviors, uh, our morality saviors. Uh, it happened then, it's happening now. And that's that's exactly what's happening with Sweet Baby Inc. Let's go to your chat comments and questions. We're going to pivot and continue to talk about this. Quick note to Sean, please read the, please come back in like 15 minutes. You're in the, you're in the green room. Come yeah. back in 15 minutes. We're behind schedule today. I think I might want to do something too. I might want to do something. I, I, I love doing our filmmaker interviews, but I really want to take time with them. I think um, this is not for you, Sean. This is my audience. I'm talking to my audience. Maybe what we do is we do all the interviews on a certain day so we can really like like a filmmaker Friday or we do something fun. And that way we can just spend because I feel like sometimes we get in a groove with the show or we get behind on things and we don't get to address things. Glenn's going to cut all this um, because we have a lot of them and, and the, the, our, our talks with filmmakers are really important. So I don't want to forget them. Um, so you're saying come back or are you saying uh, come back, come yeah. back at Come back at three or come back at three here. I'm just, just come back at three. All right. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> Distracting me. I'm trying to I, I like, maybe that's a better thing. Chat. Do you want to have just like where we do like filmmaker interviews only? I don't know. Or do we stop the flow of the show. Oh, do you know who's coming out? You know, who's coming on the show on Friday? Who? The filmmakers behind Winnie the Pooh blood and honey part two. Oh, yeah. I don't think Sean understood my message. I'm just, I'm on a roll. And when I get on a roll with stuff I really am passionate well, about, I don't yeah. want to be stopped by something. No, I understand that. I want to go, he, go he, man. I want to go. I know. Go. The problem is he came at the schedule. He came a little early and he was here at the scheduled time. It's my fault. It's my fault. Yeah. It's ultimately my fault. I'm trying to do nine things. All right. I know. Okay. Before we pivot, we're going to talk about Sweet Baby. Let's get to your chat comments and questions because a lot of great ones. Maverick Pilgrim, member for too much, is thanks for being awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Slayer 96, DA the first for two. Hail the gore, and my movie is called Because I Heart Heart. I don't know what that means, but thank you. Um, Maverick Pilgrim, this goes back to the Super Predator bullcrap. Yes, it does. In the 90s, remember that Super Predator bullcrap? Awful. By the way, loved Night Trap when I had a Sega CD32X. I also had one. I had the Sega CD 32 X. It was awesome. There's a great documentary about it here on YouTube. If you want to know more about it, it says Nicholas Vargo for four nine nine. Nicholas, please message me. I love that. And by the way, I have a whole other story. I worked for digital pictures. I worked for, I ended up leaving the magazine to go work for digital pictures because digital pictures, um, they wanted to make movies and produce games. And that was my role. Uh, but thank you. I, I'll tell that story. I've got a lot of stories. Like this brought back a flood of memories when I brought out like all the old magazines brought back like a flood of memories of like, oh my God, I really like got into trouble back then. You know, like, you, you shit that I was doing. You didn't talk about, but what, what was the result of your conversation with Dan Lundgren? Uh, did uh, he back I off? Or did he, he... I, he didn't really back off from it, but he had a better understanding. I just tried to explain to him that games are about puzzle solving. They're ultimately good for kids. And I'm I'm not against ratings. I'm against censorship. Ratings are mm -hmm. fine. It's a guide for parents. You know, this is mature audiences. This is so that's fine. Um, so there you go. Jeff for five. First it was comics, then it was cartoons, then it was uh Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. After that, it was video games. It never ends. That's my point. Yeah, that's my point. Um, let's see here. Albert Nada Retro for five, Canadian says her efforts to get married with children off the air brought it national attention and made it a hit for Fox. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I remember that, but I completely forgot that. All backfired. I, you know what's so funny? Reading that editorial, 
I haven't read, by the way, I didn't even read it before the stream. I just sort of found like a blurry copy of it. It's very blurry. And um, so I'm reading it for the first time and it's like, I was pretty based. <laughs> like I'm not, I haven't changed since that. That's 30 years ago. That's me from 30 years ago, writing in a games magazine. I'm exactly the same person. Yeah. I remember when I was at church, they would bring this guy in once a year to talk about Satanism and rock and roll. Yeah, and uh, and they would always bring up the Beatles and the backwards album or the uh, the backwards segment. Uh, the the grift goes on. Yeah. Hey, fellas, glad you're on today. Always enjoy the show. Hail Film Threat and hail the chats. A 16 bit mascot for five. Appreciate you. Some other comments here. Bush and Ryu Cat. I never you knew you had a part in informing legislators about how video games are approached. Yeah, I mean, just the one politician. What was weird was I was defending it. So basically, we were battling in the media. I've never been a part of something like that. Yeah. Not up in, I mean, well, actually, I had a few things happen with film threat back in the day, but this was one of my big battles, was that. But we fought in the media, and I said, Can we just actually talk face to face? But it never came out public that he did that. Brock Samson, it says, What a stupid politician. I would apply that to almost every politician. Yeah. He picked a fight with someone who had nothing to lose. So Chris obviously uh, didn't hold back. I kind of, I, I don't know. Do I hold back? I don't know. But I, I mean, to his credit, he, he talked to you. I yeah. mean, uh, if Matt Walsh can talk to Jeremy, uh, Dan Lundgren can talk to you. Yeah. Red French Moon says, ah, okay, bravo. If the guy actually came to discuss, I say that's a good point. Well, I was just yeah. trying to explain, to be honest and try to explain the whole puzzle solving thing. I think that's a better way to educate kids too. Like if you just, I've looked at, I've read, I've read articles and all this. Stuff. They teach kids differently in Japan than they teach them in the United States. And the United States is memorize this. Do, do like master blaster. That's a thunder beyond Thunderdome reference. Um, but in Japan, they treat it like a puzzle. So they, they are showing the work and they allow kids to guess what the responses are. And they kind of walk kids through thinking. And it's a way better way to educate kids. Um, and, you know, I have a vested interest in that as a young father at the time, you know, I was, I was like a new dad and it, like, I really like suddenly, suddenly all your priorities change and you care a lot more about certain things that you didn't care about before. Edge Scarborough says, be trying to tell people the right and the left are basically the same group. Just depends who is in power at the moment. hundred mm -hmm. percent. Those were Democrats trying to, uh, do that but also uh the well, right he was, was a republican not... he... no 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 dan lundgren's a democrat oh i could swear he was a republican nope nope i looked it up i looked up old stories in the la times democratic party bush and ryu cat for five uh, thank you for that edge scarborough bush and ryu cat for five is a member if all people have to do is form uh form a consulting firm to make entertainment your way chris gore you form a movie consulting firm film threat consultants they never hire us by the way he's he was a republican Nope, I'm looking at another article that says Democrat. Yeah, I'm looking at his. Uh, first of all, uh, he could have changed parties. He hey, let's have, not get derailed. Let's. Okay, we got go so ahead. much go stuff to do. We got so much stuff to do. Go, 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 go. Gotta help go. me. Go. Do it. Help me. Go. Do a show. <laughs> Jesus. Fuck. Pilgrim Media for two. Pilgrim Media for two. I remember Frank Zappa duking with Congress. That was great. Yeah, with, with Tipper Gore. It was Epic with Tipper Gore, Democrat. Yeah, she was a Democrat. Oh, good. We agree on something. <laughs> Jericho Leon says the sweet baby ordeal shows how gamers will not stand up to bullying by DEI agencies and their corporate partners. It makes me proud to be a part of this community. Let's take a look at that sweet baby stuff for a second, okay? How about that? Do it real quick. Nope, that's not what I wanted. I that was my fault. I wish I knew what you were looking for. That's okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Let's take a look at their website. We've all heard about Sweet Baby Inc. and their almost mafia-like practices when it comes to, you know, talking to gaming developers and and companies and offering their services to effectively do the game version 
of a movie sensitivity read that severely now impacts story where what it does is it, um, it, it, it puts the priority on different things other than gaming itself, their website. And by the way, if you go to the website, which is public sweet baby inc.com, you can sign up to get their email newsletter, which I did. Let's take a look. Founded in 2018, Sweet Baby Inc. is a narrative development and consultation studio based in Montreal. French like, Canadians. Yeah, French Canadians go. pretty much behind all that is evil when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> and working around the globe, our mission is to tell better, more empathetic stories while diversifying and enriching the video games industry. We aim to make games more engaging, more fun, more meaningful, and more inclusive for everyone and their services include everything from writing to narrative of a story to representation and development All right these are the different things um outreach new and marginalized talent can change the industry if given the proper support we want to provide this through our outreach programs here are some resources for their outreach programs. Industry reform. They are being very, this is all being done in the open, folks. This is not, a, this should surprise no one. Talk to us, uh, portfolio reviews, workshops and Q&As, dedicated mentorship programs. That's how they support. Uh, projects. Um. These are some of the announced projects. This is a lot. Alan Wake 2, God of War Ragnarok, Battle Shapers, Breeze, Usual, Jane, Goodbye, Volcano High, Sable, Sp there it is, Spider-Man 2, uh -huh. Suicide Squad, uh, Lost Your Marbles, South of Midnight, The Crew Motor Fest, just to name, to name a few. Alan, what are your thoughts? I I've, been, I've been keeping up with this and um, we'll, we'll, we'll go deeper into this, but this is of huge concern because what this, what this is, is this is impacting the very games, which in my opinion, a lot of these have just become walking simulators mm -hmm. where you're walking from one destination to the next, you go to this destination, you go over here to this destination. You're supposed to do this. this the, the side quest is here. And there's a couple here, like, you know, I mean, it just, it's because it, Alan, you game more than I do at this point. I've what? I don't know how you have the time to game play games. I only play two yeah. games. Yeah, you have a gaming channel. I don't yeah. have a gaming channel. Yeah, with one video problem? on it. I, I am getting Hell Divers too, though. Uh, but I'll that's play with you. Way. I'll okay. play with you. Yeah, let's do it. Um, look, uh, this this just goes back to how I got into the uh, movie criticism business in the first place, and th this is. My philosophy when it comes to telling stories, the stories is about connecting with your audience. Um, you know, we we all struggle through this life, uh, this this game we call life, and uh, it's great to have people come alongside with you, uh, alongside you, and say, "Hey, I've been through what you've been through. Here's how I got through it." And games is kind of a way of doing that. Um, you know, it, it that's what connects us to it. That's what that's where the great stories come from. Story, companies like Sweet Baby Inc. It's all about the lecture. It's all about telling you where you've gone wrong, you know, uh, telling you how they think the world should be. And this is this is the problem because they create a world that no one can relate to. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. We got a final comment here, and then we're going to yeah. pivot to our interview of the day. I'm so <laughs> excited to get to that. Yeah. Um, but But, yeah, these companies... They, uh, that's all they do is they lecture and they tell you way, the, the way things should be. And uh, that, that's the most frustrating thing because I can't relate to it at all. So go ahead. Uh, final comment here from Albert Nada Retro for Five Canadian. On behalf of my ancestors, I apologize for the British not pushing the French into the ocean after the battle of the Plains of Abraham. Please forgive. Apology it's accepted. French, it's the apology accepted. It's those French Canadians. Always the French Canadians. Am I right? All right. Hey, let's get to it. John Patrick <laughs> Shaw is here. Uh, 
uh, apologies at the top. I'm sorry. We, um, you know, sometimes we go long on the show. I should have given you a heads up. I did a terrible job at that. I was no out of roll. But thank you. You have an amazing music. First of all, what was, why am I spacing on the name of the film where I had you on the show? Cover your ears. Oh, I'm sorry. No. no. Previously. Fuck you all. The Uva Bowl. Okay. Story. John did the, yeah, I was just basing on that. Yes, I guess we might as well just say it now. The documentary about Uwe Boll called Fuck You All, John is the director of, and oh my God, John Patrick Shaw, that doc is so good. We ended up actually having Uwe Boll on the show. He was on the show. What a great guy. Um, and before we get to your new documentary, uh, uh, Fuck You All, which is the actual title. I, sometimes it's, I see it as F You All, but Tell us about that doc and the fallout from it. It's a great, one of the best documentaries about a filmmaker where you really learn about Uwe. Tell us about that before we talk about your new movie. Uh, that was a great experience. Just hanging out with Uwe for that long was uh, interesting to say the least. And uh, it was great. Got to talk to a lot of cool people and uh, really learn about how crazy Uwe is and how his career is so unique. Well, it's weird because he pivoted to like uh, became a restaurateur and then he uh, looks like he's getting back into making films. I hope he brings back his boxing career um, to box because he boxes uh, film critics. I always thought that was chef's kiss. Brilliant. So it's a great doc. I'm sure it's on BOD or Tubi or one of those. Is it? It's out there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's searchable. Yeah, so check out uh, F You All, a uh, really fantastic documentary. But your new documentary is called Cover Your Ears. It's a music doc that uh, I, I, I watched. Actually, I watched it a while back because you and I have been going back and forth on, on trying to get you on the show. So thank you for sticking, um, you know, uh, sticking in there. Uh, tell us about the new doc, Cover Your Ears. Uh, Cover Your Ears looks at music censorship. Um in the music industry, obviously, and uh, just over the last hundred years. So everything from the fear of jazz to the birth of rock and roll, Elvis's hips, the hippie revolution, punk, uh, birth of MTV into gangster rap and current day. This perfectly ties into our topic. We were talking about censorship in video games. And um, I got in a public fight with, uh, you know, a politician in the nineties about censorship and gaming. That was also at a time in the nineties with Tipper Gore. And this is covered in your doc where, you know, they were trying to censor music uh, at that time. This was in music is, you know, there's no digital. It's just, you buy things on what you buy it on cassette CD uh, or an album. I mean, the doc does a really good job of going through all of the music censorship through the ages. The whole thing of like, not showing Elvis from the waist down, right? Like, can you yeah. talk about all of that? It's just unbelievable. We think that like there are censorship battles being fought today. They've always been fought. It's crazy. It's just the players change. Yeah. And I mean, I kind of hate the term, but cancel culture of nowadays, uh, people think that's a new idea, but Elvis's hips, for instance, they showed his hips, his first two appearances. And then, enough people complained that by his third appearance, the hips weren't allowed. So uh, public backlash has always been around in the music industry. It is frustrating because the public backlash, if you really look at this is, you know, we could say the words cancel culture. When you really look at it, it's a vocal minority. Terry Ricolta, who tried to get married with children banned from Fox only increased the ratings do you think that there's almost like what they call the Streisand effect? Whenever like something's about to be banned, it actually just makes it more famous? Yeah, definitely. I mean, those parental advisory stickers that came out in the late 80s, uh, those just kind of pointed listeners to the albums that they wanted to find. Um, people, it's not like those songs didn't exist anymore. They were just labeled. And to a lot of people, myself included, growing up around that time, I was like, oh, those are the cool albums. It's it, it's weird. It has a different effect. We've got uh, over 1,300 people watching us live on YouTube. Um, smash that like button. Subscribe to the channel. I really do appreciate it. Uh, we've got a lot of questions, too. So we get through some of these questions from the audience. Great. Let's go to that. 
starting with from Rumble. Got a lot of who? How many people are watching us on Rumble? Love the love the crowd at Rumble. Thirty-five. Dave Ellis, twenty-four. What has been the everlasting impact on the music industry by Tipper Gore besides the explicit warning? Um, well, I think she was the first one to kind of bring it to a Senate hearing um, where politicians got involved with the music industry and what was being said and it, it extending beyond just free speech. Um, but aside from that, I mean, she was a giant target for a lot of like metal artists and punk artists. So there was a, another ripple effect she didn't really plan on, but she ended up on a lot of album covers and uh, in a lot of songs. <laughs> Well, that's something of an impact, right? I mean, let's, let's, uh, it is what it is. Uh, let's see. Question here from Krizik says, um, question for Sean, does the doc cover how, why he chose to engage with his critics in boxing matches? That's about, um, F you all. Um, I think he just wanted to see if he could. And, uh, enough people thought that it was going to be a joke and he, uh, trained for it and beat the shit out of these people. God, it's such a good doc. I got to watch it again. I love, I love docs about filmmakers. I find it really interesting. I mean, some of it's inside baseball, but it's such a weird job. Um, I don't need to tell you that. Um, <laughs> Solomon Thornton says, greetings, Sir Sean. I guess you've been knighted. What Thanks. got you into doing documentaries? Um, originally I just dropped out of film school and uh, took that, my tuition money and, wanted to make a film and knew I couldn't make a feature length narrative film for that money. So decided to do a doc. I kind of fell backwards into it. And the first one I made was on the singer of a punk band and um, kind of a legendary punk band here in Canada. And the film did pretty well. And I just kind of took the money I made from that, made the next one, so on and so forth. And now this is my seventh one, I believe. Well, the, the other thing about that is people forget like, documentaries are storytelling. I mean, it's the same. It's not, I, I'm not going to say it's, it, you know, um, it, it's different from narrative film, but when I go to a film festival, the movies I gravitate towards and are tend to be better are always the docs, mm -hmm. always the docs. Narrative features are hard to at a, um, um, they're hard to like, do well on a low budget level. Whereas a documentary, nobody doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. So, so there you go. Um, more questions here from rumble a Dallas 24 while D Snyder became the face of musical freedom in the eighties. Who do you feel is carrying that flag today? Uh, I think the torch has been passed to hip hop. Um, we, in the film we deal with kind of at the, at the end of the film and nowadays, we look at lyrics being entered into trials. Um, there's a trial going on right now with Young Thug and YSL Records, where his lyrics are being brought in as evidence um, in a RICO case. So, I mean, I think that's kind of the next frontier for censorship in music is legal action. Um, wow. So, yeah, I think the torch has been passed to hip hop, whether they wow. like it or not. Ryan Landis asks, does your film cover early metal and the satanic panic that the media ran with? Yes. Yes. That was the, one of the most fun sections to deal with. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's, you it's cover so, so much. It's so ridiculous to the satanic panic. Like people were worried that, you know, there was backwards messaging in albums. And, uh, you know, if you listen to an Aussie record, you would you know, sacrifice somebody. It was a, it was a crazy time. And that's kind of what brought on the Tipper Gore PMRC era. Wow. Yeah. We used to have a guy come in to our youth group at church talking about uh, Satanism and in rock and roll. Uh, the one question I have is from a right standpoint, is a music documentary more difficult or more challenges than a film documentary? Um, I mean, both have a lot of property that you have to, clear or rely on fair use for but um this film especially in my career has been was a nightmare for clearances um there were oh hundreds, my God. hundreds and hundreds of instances that uh, we had to go through with a fine tooth comb with our lawyers but luckily there is fair use laws that protect documentary filmmakers 
Well, to talk about that, that for a second, I, I made a documentary uh, last year and again, it was the clearances. You have this whole spreadsheet and then you're, you're, you're debating about, well, how many seconds can this shot be? It has to be when you get what you think is your picture lock. I'm sure there's just like a whole other, this should go to anyone out there who's an aspiring documentary filmmaker, What you need to know fair use, look up the fair use laws. Um, I actually hired the lawyer who wrote the fair use argument to work on my film um, because I wanted the best to be able to be able to legally release the movie. Uh, what are some tips you could give filmmakers about that? I think that's just it. Before you even embark on your documentary, familiarize yourself with the fair use law and, uh, and get the right legal team. It's worth spending the money because you can finish your entire film and then run into these little hangups that will uh, completely tank your film and make it unreleasable. And from uh, Rumble, Adele is 24 says, what is your opinion on the recent trials of uh, YNW, Melly and Young Thug? Yeah, I'm not cool. I don't know what yeah, yeah why uh, that look to include rap lyrics as evidence in the case. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of what I was speaking to earlier about. That's the next frontier for censorship. It is a strange gray area, and I, you know, it's an ongoing trial, and I guess we'll figure out what where it lands. But uh, yeah, it does raise some questions. If these are all examples, not to do with these trials, but if someone's murdered that you've been writing rival songs about and it's done in the same way that you write a rap about, can that be entered into trial? And it's, I don't think it's a open and shut case either way. Um, I think it's, it's quite interesting. And I, I've been following the, the cases that you mentioned. And uh, just to right here, we got Thomas Pickett says, just bought it. Thanks Solomon Thornton. And I'm, I'm still hyped for this doc. So there you go. Uh, getting some Great. love there. Um, uh, Sean, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, I apologize about it. It's uh, I blame myself. I always, I have to blame myself, but thank you so much. Uh, Cover your ears is now available. Tell us where we, where people can get it. Um, Amazon prime, Apple TV plus uh, voodoo, YouTube. Um, everywhere to search it it's there and uh make sure to let us know about your next documentary sean thank you so much for being on the show we appreciate it and uh thank you man keep fighting the good fight because yeah, uh thanks chris we need more recruits in this area so i agree there you go. <laughs> all right take care have a great rest of your day later thanks Bye. all right oops so, Oops, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm anticipating. I'm anticipating uh, button presses. Yeah, uh, it's also available at Walmart. It's also available at Walmart. All right, good. Just, just look. Part of the purpose of this show is to let people know about movies that are worthwhile that you have to check out. So, uh, I just think maybe we could do more on our other channel. We have a film threat interviews channel. By the way, we're going to clip this interview. We're going to put it on the interview channel like we do with all of our interviews. If you just want to like just go watch filmmaker interviews, go to film threat interviews. Um, there's a link on the main channel for that. And this discussion, my apologies today. I got to apologize to my team. Uh, at, well, you know, I'm not, I'm just thank to Alan, I miss <laughs> Peak Coffee. And the, I, I looked at the list of things and people kept adding things. I moved some things. We were trying to do too many things today. And that's typical. It's sort of like, this is, this is, can I just tell you a metaphor for my life? <laughs> Let me tell you a metaphor for my life. Tell me if you relate to this. I'm at my car and I just went grocery shopping and I've got all these bags. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? I'm just going to do it in one trip. I'm going to do it in one trip from the car to the, to the house. I'm going to do one trip with all these bags. So you get all the bags and your fingers are just turning white knuckle, right? From holding these bags as you walk to your place, carrying all the groceries at one time, you look weird. You look like you have giant pot. It's bizarre. And you then you're trying to, oh, I got to fish for my keys. It turns into <laughs> this whole thing. That is me trying to do a show. I'm trying to do too much on the show. And... um. 
Well, I you definitely do too much before the show. That screwed me up also. <laughs> like, I got to tell Gary, I got I need 30 minutes minimum between the nooner. See, he doesn't want to have to do the, the square up. He just wants to read every super chat. So um, unless it's specifically, I, I'll just talk to Gary. It's not a big deal. But I appreciate you. We had a good number of people watching us today live. I always appreciate that. Thank you. We will be back on Friday. And we have some, let me tell you what's coming up on Friday. We're going to talk about Roadhouse. We're going to talk about three. No, we're going to talk uh, yeah. more with Late Night with the Devil. We're going to talk Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And God, what else are we talking are about? Are you seeing You Can Call Me Bill? I'm seeing it tonight. Okay, we could talk about that. Let's add that to the list because I am a huge fan of Mr. Shatner. Um, yeah, we'll talk about Three Body Problem a week from today. Alan and I will have seen it. I have an amazing topic for a week from today that is going to blow your mind. That is going to blow your mind. I can't wait to show it to you. This conversation about gaming, it crosses over into film because we are seeing the video game and the film industry uh, content being gatekept mm -hmm. and manipulated and changed and not with the best interest of the end user, the audience. So we're going to keep, we're going to stay on top of it. And as you can tell from my this is the pile I dug up, Alan. I couldn't even go through it all. I couldn't find the actual article. This is just some of the magazines that uh, I was. Is this the issue that I was that I did? Um, it's crazy. The the like how much like this. It's just it's nuts. Was this the issue? I'm not sure. All I could say is this. It was. Um, this was something. This was my day job. I did film thread on the side back then. And we were mortal, mortal Kombat was like this recurring thing we covered because people loved it. The people from uh Midway loved us. We always got look at this. Look, just there you go. Yeah, MK2 back when video games are fun. MK2. Cool. This is when video games were fun. Look at these covers. It's nuts. Look, here it is. Sega's 32X. Look at that right there donkey kong country look these were the good days remember this when the gameplay was was the was the focus we changed our logo here by the um, way it only took me 10 minutes to buy my xbox 360 day one did it really i was 18 hours in a line i'm not joking because yeah, you bought it in a popular area not i bought it in best buy i bought it at best buy i know you got to go to uh, the boonies and buy it There's yeah no that's line. what everybody tells me anyway so um we'll stay on top of that story oh my god I got too many magazines here. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, I did film thread on the side while I was a video game magazine editor back then. But even then I, I kept getting in trouble. I would always get in trouble. So it happens. Hey, want to say to Nicholas Vargo, hope you have a review for love lies bleeding soon. Alan is going to see that. Yeah. Well, I was going to see snack shack. Um, yeah, it'll go on the list. Let's add it. Um, right. We have to change that list for Friday. Hey, want to thank you. Thank our mods. Lord Thoth, our mod. I guess only one mod today. And Miss Pea Coffee and Glenn. And I want to say to Gary, you got to, I got to, I need like a half hour <laughs> in between the show. I have to have a, you know, I have to have a talk. Well, yeah. Please, Part I of that, there's a little bit of discipline you have to have, like saying it's 1230. I got to go. Oh my God. Gary got on the stream and said, we're going to, we're just doing a 90 minute show today. <laughs> we, we're just doing a 90 minute show. And it was like two hours and 50 minutes. So, Hey, I love the guy. I love Gary. Congrat. By the way, congratulations to yeah. Gary for hitting a million subs. Congrats to him. Well-earned, well-earned. Uh, I am going tonight. You can tell from my shirt or you can tell from my shirt that got uh, stuff all over it. <laughs> my Star Trek shirt. This is my Star Trek shirt with the Mr. William Shatner. Um, I will be at the Regal in Pasadena. I'm just going to walk there. I'll be there in two hours and I'm going to see my name is Bill. I'm going to go watch it. I'm going to go watch it right now. 
uh, and I'll be seeing that in a couple hours. And I want to thank you to everyone in the chat. Your questions and comments are awesome. And to cast again, I will not Shatner myself, but he will be doing a live via satellite um, conversation, which will be great. Can't wait to see it. A lot of films coming up. Look at this. Look at this. We got Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, Godzilla X Kong, and finally Civil War April 12th. We might be in Vegas when that happens. So it's going to be great. Um, Alan, one thing I thought that was funny was earlier was... Yeah, you got to keep up. You got to keep up. Yeah, got to keep up. Keep it up. <laughs> Rock it hard. Make it work. <laughs> and make it so. I want that printed out so hanging up in the in the film thread office. I know we do. And somebody that ties into like, like whatever. I love those motivational posters. I'm glad I could contribute uh, to that. All right, everyone. I'll see you on Friday, Alan. Let's get out of here.